inviting me to your pulpit this morning. You know, every one of us is a hologram. As I looked back over this, I thought, man, I'm going back to a lot to bring to you. So I thank you for inviting me. Please pray with me. Empty me. Empty me, O oh God, and fill me with your spirit so that your word may be revealed and not obscured by my words. Quiet our minds so that we are present to your presence in this sanctuary. Amen. I am the vine and you are the branches. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. These are the words of Jesus in today's Gospel text, a portion of his final discourse that he gave to his disciples. He instructs them because he knows he is not going to be with them any longer. When he will be no longer present, maybe that sounds familiar. Worship continues to be the most important thing we do as a faith community. It's where we celebrate our relationship with God. We build strong relationships with each other. We deepen our personal and corporate faith. We hold each other in prayer. We are renewed to do the work Pilgrim is called to do. We strive to be the church in the world today. Scholars suppose a joining community near the turn of the first century, out of which both the gospel and the letters came. The Gospel of John and the first letter of John bear striking similarities. Word and incarnation, abiding in Jesus, abiding in God. We are children of God. The world, the culture of humans, stands in opposition to God's created world. Love one another. God is love. Beloved, one love one another. For God is love. The book of First John, the letter First John, expands on John's gospel, and probably was written about a decade after the gospel itself. This faith community is under pressure in the particular place and time. First John affirms the community's identity as a faithful to the teachings of Jesus that they have heard from the beginning. The disciples are God's beloved children, people of the covenant. They belong to God, Jesus, who will protect and empower them. And they are encouraged to confess rather than deny their shortcomings, to love one another and to resist the world. And like Paul, the author exhorts these Christians to pray. Both the Gospel and the letter were written at a time when conflict between non-Christian Jews and Christian Jews was intensifying. The first followers of the way were Jews. One early disagreement in the church, imagine a disagreement in the church, <laughs> was whether you had to become a Jew before you could become a Christian. So 1 John underlines the central affirmations and practices of faithful discipleship. Both books are saturated with love. God is love, and those who abide in God and love abide in God, and God abides in them. Our abode is our home, and we abide in God. We find a home in God. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we ought also to love one another. When we love one another, God loves, lives in us. If we love one another, God lives in us. We love because, because God first loved us. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. Simple, profound, repetitive, difficult to achieve, and even more difficult to sustain and maintain. Like everything else, it takes practice. 
Practice provides the pathway. But just how do we practice love? Let's start by looking at another letter so often read at weddings. St. Paul closes his section of his first letter to the Corinthians with the spiritual gifts, and he expands upon the spiritual gift of love with an analysis of the elements of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love envies no one. Love is never boastful, nor conceited, nor rude. Love is never selfish, not quick to take offense. Love keeps no score of wrongs. Love keeps no score of wrongs. Love does not insist on its own way. Love delights, delights in the truth. There is nothing love cannot face. Nothing that love cannot face. Love endures all things. Love never ends. Speaking of weddings, yesterday's wedding here gave us a preview of today's message when Jen's sister read from the world, according to Mr. Rogers. My ears heard some things and I thought, wow, oh, that's a message tomorrow too. Accepting the other exactly as he is or she is and a quotation about listening. How can, <clears throat> how can we love each other if we do not listen to them and find out who they are? The church introduced me to Morton Kelsey many years ago. In his book, Caring, How Can We Love One Another, he has written a wonderful chapter on love and listening. These are some of the pearls. Genuine love is always centered on the need of the other person and ministering to that need. It is not a matter of giving what we feel like giving, but giving what the other needs for his or her present joy and future development. When we try to love without first knowing the needs of those around us, we are likely to be ministering to our own needs, not theirs. It is impossible for us to love one another, to love other people, unless we listen to them. We simply cannot love without learning to listen. Listening that does not judge or evaluate, but listening for the nuggets of gold within that other person. Who is she? Who is she? <clears throat> Why is listening so important? The answer is quite simple. We all want to be known for who we are, and we all are unique. Being fully known by another is to experience love, and to experience love is to experience God, for God is love. Kelsey continues, real love goes out to others as they are, not as we think they are or want them to be. And this requires that we listen. There's a spark of the divine in each of us, and when we are listening with total openness, <coughs> we can come into communion with that reality. Listening on this level, we come to love those who have revealed themselves to us, for we experience them as God bearers. Beloved, if we love one another, God lives in us and we abide in God, we have find a home with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Yesterday, as we heard Jen's sister read, to love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way he or she is. It's far more difficult to accept a person for the way he or she is not. At least I find that true for myself. How someone we care about falls short of our expectation. The kind of love we find in today's lesson accepts people as they are, not as well as as they are. When we love, we know God. And yet, and yet, in our human relationships and within any human community, there will be disappointments. 
Reverend Nadia Bowles Weber, a Lutheran pastor in Denver, has written several compelling books about her job as the leader of the local church parish, House for All Saints and Sinners. Let me share a few words from her 2013 book, Pastors. She writes, I'm still an idealist, not an idealist, when it comes to our human projects. Every human community will disappoint us, regardless of how well-intentioned or inclusive. But I am idealistic about God's redeeming work in my life and in the world. So she says it to me, she has a quarterly meeting to welcome new people and ask them what drew them to her church. She's always the last to speak at those events. And she writes, I tell them that I love hearing all that they did, that, that, and that I too love being in a spiritual community where I don't have to add or take away from my own story to be accepted. But I have learned something and I want them to hear me. This community will disappoint you. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I don't like to hear those words, but we remember this is not our church. This is God's church. And so she says, I invite them on this side of the inevitable disappointment to decide if they'll stick around when that disappointment happens. If they choose to leave when we don't meet their expectations, they won't get to see how the grace of God can come in and fill in the holes left by our community's failure. And that's just too beautiful and too real to miss. Today's passage is about the corporate, but it's about the personal, and those things happen in our personal lives as well. And so as I was concluding this, I remembered words from the prophet by Cahil Duran. Work is love made visible. It reminded me of a hymn that they didn't bring from the pilgrim hymnal. Creator God, we give you thanks that this your world is incomplete, that you have not yet finished us, that work awaits our hands and feet. As Pilgrim continues through its time of transition with an intentional interim minister, to le today's lessons are powerful reminders that love weaves together the personal and our corporate life. The metaphor of the vine implies that God is the gardener. So I invite you to allow God's love to flow through you and expand Pilgrim as you welcome Reverend Michelle Hughes. Imagine the possibilities that lie ahead for Pilgrim. Create God's future in a ch church built on the solid foundation of Pilgrim's experience. It's Pilgrim's structures and the relationships you all have developed here, within these walls and beyond these walls. And undergirding all of this will be the strength of our love for one another, for our neighbors and for our triune God. Jesus said, I am the vine, and my Father is the wine, vine grower. Beloved, we are the branches. When we love our neighbor, God lives in us. Let us love one another.